just ask you to speak to me. Okay. And ignore the camera. All right. <clears throat> you can start off by telling me your name, where you live, and what you do. Keith Shelton. I live in Denton. I recently, about a year ago, retired from the University of North Texas journalism faculty. <clears throat> and were you born and raised in Texas? Or? I was born in Oklahoma, lived in Oklahoma until I went away to college and have lived in Texas ever since, except for time in the Army. So what made you come to Texas? Um, it was the nearest school that I could afford uh, to my hometown in Oklahoma. <clears throat> and uh, what do you think of Texas in general? I've lived in Texas now more than I lived in Oklahoma, so I'm really a Texan, and uh, I particularly enjoy Denton. We've lived in Denton over 30 years, and um, <clears throat> it's a great city. And so what, besides um, teaching journalism, what have you done? I worked on newspapers for 23 years. I taught for 23 years. Just coincidence that they were both the same. <clears throat> Are you very familiar with uh, the history of Dealey Plaza? Is it something that came up? Just having worked in Dallas uh, for six years at the Times Herald and uh, <clears throat> being aware of it, basically. Uh, do you have any impressions of G.B. Dealey? Uh, that pretty, pretty negative. Why is um, that? He was very conservative, uh, and the Dallas Morning News was extremely conservative. Uh, <clears throat> so, and you know, Dealey built the newspaper, and it was it was a, a great newspaper in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I, I thought he and the paper were too conservative. G.B. Dealey, the, the father or the son that took over when, in the 60s? Well, Ted Dealey is the one who was there in the 60s. G.B. Dealey is the one that founded the paper. Right. And you thought they were both too conservative? Or? Well, um, one of the great things the Morning News did under G.B. Dealey was to oppose the Klan in Dallas. The Ku Klux Klan was very strong in Dallas in the 20s, and the Morning News opposed them, and that took a lot of courage. So I admired them for that. <clears throat> but I, I, I guess the paper was more conservative under Ted Dealey. And uh, what were your impressions of President Kennedy when, when he was still president? Well, I was a great admirer. Uh, I think um, <clears throat> most of the country were favorable to him as a person. Uh, he was young and good looking and rich. And, um, politically, of course, there were a lot of people opposed to his pol politics. <clears throat> he was too liberal for a lot of people. Um, but. I admired him and his policies. And so can you tell me about that Dallas trip? You followed him on the whole trip, correct? Right. Tell me what you remember about the trip. Um, the, um, some, a little bit of background on the trip. Um, it was just before the 64 election, <clears throat> about the same relationship to the 64 election as we are now to the 04 election. So the campaign had, had sort of started. Um, Kennedy's re-election was far from certain. Um, he had a lot of opposition. He had not had very much success with Congress. Um, <clears throat> there had been the Bay of Pigs fiasco and the missile crisis with Cuba and so forth. Um, Kennedy wanted to come to Texas because Texas was a key state. Um, 
<clears throat> always is because it has so many electoral votes. Barry Goldwater was uh, going to be his opponent, Republican nominee, and he was very conservative. Uh, Kennedy wanted to come to San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, and Dallas. Um, San Antonio had a large um, Latin American population um, who were Catholics. Um, it had a large military population and military people tend to vote for the commander-in-chief, whoever it is. Um, Houston was a uh, sort of a capital of Protestantism. Baptists were very strong and uh, <clears throat> one of the issues with Kennedy had been his Catholicism. He was the first Catholic elected president. Um, <clears throat> Seems very odd now, but at the time um, there was opposition to having a Catholic president because his loyalty would be to the Pope and not to the Constitution. So that issue was still around, and he wanted to go to Houston to um, address that issue. Um, he wanted to come to Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, <clears throat> Fort Worth was pretty strongly Democratic and uh, he wanted to shore up support there. Um, Dallas was um, very much Goldwater territory. Um, Goldwater was very popular in, in Dallas. Dallas was extremely conservative. Um, Dallas had the only Republican congressman in Texas, and uh, that congressman was very much for Goldwater and very conservative. Um, Dallas leadership didn't want him to come at all. Um, <clears throat> but they were not really in a position to tell the president he couldn't come. So there was a compromise worked out. <clears throat> um, it was to be a nonpartisan visit. He was to be here as president not as a Democrat, not as a candidate. And his visit was supposed to be nonpartisan. Um, <clears throat> the Dallas Citizens Council sponsored it as a nonpartisan organization. Uh, so that was the background of, of this trip. Um, <clears throat> my assignment was to join the uh, presidential um, <clears throat> traveling press at San Antonio. Um, I covered him in San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, and Dallas. I wrote stories about the San Antonio and Houston uh, trips, and uh, I covered the breakfast at Fort Worth uh, <clears throat> where he spoke. Then my assignment was to cover the speech at the trademark at noon. The night before, I had gotten a copy of the text of his speech to be delivered at noon. I wrote a story based on that speech, and I filed a copy of the full text. Those were set in type and ready to go in the paper. Um, <clears throat> our main edition uh, was it had about an 11.30 deadline. But we were going to hold up that um, three star until he started speaking. So as soon as he started speaking at the, at the trademark, we would release that three star edition, which had my story in it about the speech and, and the text of the speech. Well, obviously he never started, so that edition never got printed. Um, <clears throat> I took notes from Love Field um, all the way in, even though I wasn't assigned to do that. It was just sort of the instinct. So I had a lot of notes about the motorcade route. Um, when I went by the uh, 
Dr. Pepper's sign on Mockingbird Lane, I wrote down the time and temperature, just every detail that I could write down. Um, when the president was shot, um, our bus had turned north on that one block jog on Houston Street. So we were at, at ground level and the, the president's car was on that in decline. So we couldn't see the top of the car, but our photographers saw the rifle sticking out the window. Um, <clears throat> when we heard the shots, um, about half the people on the bus yelled at the driver to stop so we could see what happened. The other half were yelling at him to chase the president. Um, it was a moot point because the police wouldn't let us stop. So we went to the trademark where he was supposed to be going. And when we got there and he wasn't there, we realized that he probably had been hit. Um, later it was determined that the uh, president's car, by the time it hit 35E, was going 90 miles an hour. They got out of there fast. <laughs> the uh, Secret Service rehearses going to the hospital whenever there's a motorcade. Any place along the route, they know how to get to the nearest hospital. That's just part of their preparations. So they knew where, where Parkland was, they knew how to get there. Um, when I got to the trademark, um, the place was full of people waiting to eat lunch and uh, my wife was in the audience. Um, <clears throat> we kind of thundered through the place where they were set up for lunch and um, at the back there were some telephones set up for the press but for some reason you couldn't make a local call on them. They were all long distance which didn't make any sense, but I went to the mezzanine uh, and went in the first office that I came to. The secretary was talking on the phone as diplomatically as I could. I took the phone away from her and hung it up and called the office. My assignment then was to cover what happened at the trademark. <clears throat> first there was an announcement that the president had been delayed. And then there was an announcement that the president had been hit. And then later on, an announcement he had, that, that was dead. <clears throat> um, there were a few people in the audience who had little portable radios. So some of them knew that, that he had been hit. And there was a discussion in the audience and, and people clustering around these little radios. Um, the head of the Minister's Association had a, a, gave a prayer. Uh, the mayor said a few words. The uh, head of the uh, Citizens Council said a few words and then everybody left. Um, I noticed that the presidential seal had been on the lectern at where the president was to speak and suddenly it was gone. <clears throat> the Secret Service took it. Um, I later found out that they took some of the food to be tested to see if it was poison. Um, the Secret Service was extremely nervous. <clears throat> um, since I've been traveling with them, I, I recognized some of the Secret Service people and they recognized me. But um, trying to go from where I was to the back, uh, I was blocked. They, wouldn't, they were sealing off that area. Um, so then I went back downtown to the office and uh, turned in what I had at the trademark. Um, my next assignment was to um, interview Bob Jackson, the photographer, our photographer who was on the bus. 
and I wrote a story with his byline saying, I saw the president, I saw the rifle sticking out the window. And that ran with his name on it. <clears throat> then I interviewed the motorcycle officer on Kennedy's left. Part of Kennedy's head had splattered on his uniform. Um, I didn't write that, but <clears throat> um, I interviewed him and did a story with his byline saying I was on the Kennedy's, on Kennedy's left and so forth. Uh, so that's what I did the day of the assassination. He was on the front left. <clears throat> um, I had been putting in long hours the previous two days. Um, when you're covering a president like that, your your day is about 20 hours long because you get up early and put out your luggage and you work all day and all night and then right into the early morning hours. So I had a sinus infection and I had a fever. <clears throat> so about 11 o'clock they sent me home and I was to come back at 5 o'clock the next day. Um, that Saturday I did miscellaneous things. Um, I was asked to write a story about the political implications of the assassination and having a Texan as president, which was kind of foolish. Nobody knew. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I did a story and, and what I said pretty much turned out to be correct. Um, Sunday I was supposed to be off and I was supposed to come in at 5 o'clock on the Monday morning after that. Well, as soon as uh, Ruby shot Oswald, everybody went back to work. <clears throat> um, I called the office and at that point they thought Oswald had been um, turned over to the sheriff. They thought he was the sheriff's prisoner. So my assignment was to go ask the sheriff how he let his prisoner get shot, <clears throat> which wasn't a fun assignment. The sheriff was Bill Decker, who was a legendary Texas sheriff, had been sheriff for many years, <clears throat> sort of made up the rules as he went along. <clears throat> and I wasn't anxious to go ask him how he let his prisoner get shot. As soon as I got to the sheriff's office, he uh, immediately let me know it wasn't his prisoner. <clears throat> so for about 45 minutes, he, uh, showed me how, what the security precautions were at the sheriff's office. <clears throat> once, they arrived, once Oswald arrived there, they had these different security uh, plans, and he, he showed me exactly what they would have done had he gotten down there. Uh, so then I went back to the office, and uh, we were trying to put together a profile of Jack Ruby. Who was he? Nobody. Well, we all knew Ruby because he pestered uh, everybody at the newspapers to get publicity for his nightclub. And he was just old Jack. <clears throat> well, we didn't know his, his background. Um, his background was in Chicago and Detroit. He had been kind of a labor goon, you know, beating up pickets and things like that. Um, so my job was to make contact with a newspaper in Chicago and we swapped information about every 30 minutes or so. I would call them and, and give them everything we found in Dallas about Ruby and they gave us everything they found in Detroit and Chicago about Ruby. Somehow they got the uh, Wayne County clerk in Detroit to open up on Sunday and give them records. So we were putting together a pretty good profile of Ruby. Um, after that, uh, we all did miscellaneous things. Um, I've been asked who wrote the story, who covered the story. Well, we all did. We all did bits and pieces, and it was put together by the rewrite desk at the paper. Um, so 
we went back to our regular jobs, but we were all doing assassination-related things for several months, dealing with out-of-town uh, media and that kind of stuff. Um, were you, had you met the president before or seen the president personally? I'd covered him before. You don't really meet him, and, and he didn't I didn't have any press conferences that I covered. But I had covered him previously. Is your, what was your impression of him uh, firsthand? Well, he was very charismatic. Um, wherever he went, he dominated the scene. Um, he was an extremely good politician. He paid a lot of attention to details. Um, he, he, he was just very skillful. And, Charming. And uh, what were your impressions of Governor Connolly? Well, I had covered Governor Connolly uh, for a long time. I covered him when he was a first first a candidate. But I first knew him <clears throat> when he was uh, the main aide to Lyndon Johnson as senator and vice president. So I had known him because he was part of Johnson's staff, just marginally. But um, I wrote, I think, the first story saying he was going to be a candidate for governor. Um, one of my contacts in Dallas was a regional governmental affairs director for uh, Ford Motor Company. His job was to keep track of politics and government in Texas and Louisiana and I think maybe Oklahoma. So he was a good source <clears throat> and he was close to Lyndon Johnson and uh, John Conley, closer to Conley. Um, he tipped me off that uh, Conley, Conley was not well known. He was uh, um, in Kennedy's cabinet. He was, uh, I believe at the time, Secretary of the Navy, um, but the general public didn't know him very well. <clears throat> and um, Price Daniel was governor of Texas and was ex was was running for re-election, and everybody expected him to be re-elected. Well, um, I told this contact that I would run a story saying he was going to resigned from the cabinet and run for governor. But <clears throat> um, Connie couldn't be quoted. Um, nobody could be quoted. Um, if Connie had, <clears throat> had, had said he was going to run for governor, he would have been ineffective in, as a cabinet member. He would have come under <clears throat> election laws and so forth. So he couldn't announce it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but he needed to get the word out because he didn't want his friends to get committed to Price Daniel. And he didn't want anybody to run um, for governor in the primary uh, not knowing that he was going to run. If they knew he was going to run, they wouldn't run. So it was, he needed to get the word out. So I told this contact that I would run the story and I would take responsibility for it if he would go to Conley and, and, and get him to say he would do it. It was not a trial balloon or anything. He was really going to do it. Then I would run the story. <clears throat> he talked to Conley and Conley agreed and I ran the story. Um, <clears throat> and the story said, <coughs> excuse me, um, Treasury Secretary John Connolly plans to resign from the cabinet and run for governor of Texas. The Times Herald has learned. No source. So it was my responsibility. If it didn't happen, I was dead as a political writer. <laughs> um, this was about September, I think. Um, in uh, be 60, I guess it would be 61 maybe. 
And in December, the New York Times ran the same story. And then in January, he announced. So I was greatly relieved. <laughs> but I had known John and, and Nellie a long time. Um, after the assassination, I covered Connolly in Parkland when he was a patient there. And uh, uh, later, maybe a year later, when he had his last checkup at Parkland, I went with him and Nellie. And I was the only reporter with him when he went through. And the doctors showed him step by step where he was and what they did. And uh, they showed him on a mock-up where the bullet went. Um, he almost died. He was, he was hurt a lot worse than most people realize. And in fact, uh, the wound eventually killed him years later. But he, he died of pneumonia related to a lung problem. The, the bullet went through his lungs one of his lungs. Um, Never completely healed, right? No. Um, but that was my relationship with Connor. So you had a favorable impression of him? Oh yeah, he was a great man. And when he first um, announced that he was going to run, um, I went down to his ranch in Floresville and uh, spent the day and did a long profile story about him, it interviewed him and his brothers, and did a, a magazine story. The Times Herald had a magazine on Sundays in those days, and his profile ran in the Sunday magazine. What did you think of his later decision to switch parties? I was very disappointed in that. I, I thought he owed more to the Democratic Party than, than that, but I understood why he did it, it was pragmatic. Um, Johnson was grooming him to be president. Johnson um, <clears throat> wanted to be president um, when Kennedy was, well he ran for president against Kennedy. Um, Johnson felt that um, he really couldn't make it as president. He couldn't get elected. So he was grooming Connolly to run for president. And uh, he was in the cabinet. He, uh, governor of Texas, and was eventually going to run for president after Kennedy's terms ended. Um, Once um, Johnson became president, it was obvious that Connolly couldn't be elected because, you know, after two terms, presumably two terms of Johnson, or one in a part, or two maybe, um, the country wasn't going to elect another Texan, another Southerner. So his presidential hopes were crushed. And so how was it pragmatic for him to switch parties? Well, he was still active in politics and uh, he, uh, the Republican Party had grown a lot and uh, was important and uh, he was appointed uh, Secretary of the Treasury, so he had political appointments. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think he had presidential ambitions anymore. Uh, but I'm just wondering what, just because Texas went Republican, it was pragmatic. Well, and, and, and uh, Nixon was elected, so the Republicans were in, in uh, the White House. That was a factor. And uh, what were your impressions of Johnson? Johnson was an enigma. Um, he had several personalities. He, uh, 
as a reporter, sometimes he'd greet you like a long lost son and put his arms around you. And sometimes he would just snub you and wouldn't even talk to you. Um, <clears throat> he was a very interesting man. He had a lot more ability than he ever got credit for. Um, but uh, <clears throat> he, he could be mean and arrogant and a lot of different things. Um, but he got things done. When he was uh, in the Senate and Sam Rayburn was in the House, those two men could get just about anything done they wanted done. <clears throat> Um, I covered Johnson a lot, some as president, but mostly before as a senator and vice president. Um, I got a letter from him once thanking me for a story I did about a Pakistani camel driver, which was a weird story. Um, Johnson, as Vice President was in Pakistan on some kind of a diplomatic trip. And uh, <clears throat> no matter where he was, Johnson acted like he was running for justice of the peace. He was always politicking, always shaking hands. As President, Vice President, Senator, whatever, he was always running. Well, in Pakistan, <clears throat> He did the same thing. He went through the crowd shaking the hands with Pakistanis <laughs> like he was trying to get their vote. <laughs> well, he, he, met, he was introduced to this Pakistani camel driver named Bashir Ahmad. And typical Johnson, he just said, you know, if you're ever in the United States, come and visit us and, uh, in Texas at the ranch. Well, nobody thought anything more about it. Well, there was a program called, I believe it was People to People, where uh, this nonprofit organization promoted trips between, among countries. Well, they decided it'd be a good PR deal to take this camel driver to Texas. So, they brought Bashir Ahmad to Dallas, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to take him to took him then to the ranch. Well, it, it it was embarrassing. This poor guy had never been out of his village. Um, he uh, was illiterate in any language, um, and he was just completely stunned. Um, <clears throat> This village where he was was poverty stricken. They took him to a supermarket to show him all the plentiful foods and so forth. Well, a lot of the stories kind of made fun of the guy, and I didn't. I, I wrote it straight. And uh, they gave him a pickup, and he didn't know anything about pickups or didn't know how to drive. So he traded his pickup when he got back home, he traded it for another camel. <laughs> well, after that story ran, I got a letter from Johnson and thanked me for uh, treating the story seriously, not making fun of the guy. Um, <clears throat> but there were a lot of different uh, times that I covered Johnson and they were pretty interesting. Were you surprised by his decision not to run again? No, because of the war. He really couldn't do anything about the war in Vietnam and um, <clears throat> the country was against the war. So I, I think he did the right thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about the aftermath for Dallas, how Dallas was treated as a city after Kennedy was shot? Well, as I said, Dallas was very conservative. Um, E.M. Ted Dealey had gone to the White House with a bunch of publishers 
and uh, had criticized Kennedy to his face. And that was very embarrassing for the city, some people in the city. Um, Time Magazine did a story criticizing the Dallas Morning News because they had no middle or left columnists at all. All their columnists were very conservative. Um, so Dallas was perceived as um, a hotbed of extreme conservatism at the time. Um, General Edward A. Walker, a retired Army general, was uh, one of the leaders of the um, conservatives in Dallas. And he had a press conference and urged people to go to Mississippi and block integration. They were going to admit uh, James Meredith to the University of Mississippi. And he led a, a group of people from Dallas and elsewhere to fight integration at Mississippi. And there was a confrontation with a bunch of U.S. Marshals. Um, <clears throat> So, um, at the, after the, at the time of the assassination, <clears throat> Dallas was pretty much blamed by a lot of the media and, and political people and civic leaders and so forth because of its right-wing atmosphere. Um, at first, when Kennedy was shot, most people thought that some extreme conservative had done it when in fact uh, Oswald was, if anything, a communist, but mainly not political. Uh, Oswald had shot at General Walker and missed him. And there were indications that he had plans to shoot Nixon. So he, he was not political in that sense. Um, so Dallas took a lot of criticism nationally. Dallas Townsend, who was a CBS correspondent, um, signed off one of his reports by saying, this is Dallas Townsend, that is, because he didn't want to be associated with Dallas. Um, Dallas changed dramatically. Um, the Dallas Morning News changed dramatically. They um, added some uh, columnists who were not so far to the right. Their editorial position moderated some. Um, and, and the leadership of Dallas did a lot of things to, uh, to overcome that stigma. Did you ever personally experience people who held something against Texas or when they heard that you were from Texas? Well, there were a lot of calls to the Times Herald all over the world yelling at Dallas for killing the president. And, and that continued for a couple of weeks, I think. People just call up and tell you you were Yeah, just... they'd call from Paris or London or somewhere start ranting about Dallas. Um, what things do you think helped improve Dallas's image after that? I heard one commentator not long ago say the Dallas Cowboys helped more than anything. <laughs> I, I think the fact that the city did change, um, time passed, you know, nobody blames Buffalo for killing McKinley. Nobody blames Washington for killing Lincoln. So I think time helped a lot and Dallas changed some. Uh, one thing <laughs> that occurred, first time I had to go to the White House after the assassination, the way, the way you get in the White House is your name has to be on the gate, on the list at the gate then you have to prove who you are. Well, the only 
this is before Texas driver's license had pictures on them. The only picture ID I had was Dallas Police Department. Well, this sergeant on the gate, the, these White House guards are all Secret Service. This sergeant on the gate that checked my identification had a very distinct Boston accent. He had been a Kennedy appointee and he saw that Dallas Police Department press card. He checked me out pretty good. <laughs> but that's all, all the picture ID I had. I had a press card, but it didn't have a picture. Um, what do you think of the uh, Kennedy Memorial they put it in 71? I liked it. I thought it was appropriate and dignified. I've, I've been disappointed in the maintenance of it. It's not been well kept, but I thought it was appropriate. And what do you think of uh, the Sixth Floor Museum? Well, I'm impressed. Um, I did an oral history for them, and I gave them a lot of my memorabilia. You know, my when you travel with the president, you get a tag that says "Trip of the President" and all of that. And my invitation to the luncheon and some of those things. And um, I think they've done a very good job. Why do you think it took so long to get that museum built? Well, for one thing, I think for a long time Dallas didn't want to remember it that much. Um, and um, it was a question of money, too. Somebody had to pay for it. And uh, the federal government wasn't interested. In, uh, I think it was money more than anything. Had to have somebody come up with the money and the interest to do it. So when you go through Dallas today, if you come, if you go through Dealey Plaza, does it strike you in any particular way? Or? No, because you know I lived there six years and went by there all the time, so it, it really wasn't any different. Sometimes I notice the tourists around. But I really don't think about it much. Are you surprised at all how much the tourists are investigating this park? Um, a little bit, but uh, I mean they visit Ford's Theater in Washington and uh, it's a historical place, so I'm not too surprised. What do you think about the conspiracy peddlers? I really get angry about that. Um, I think a lot of people have made up stuff to sell books, and I, I just don't think that's right. Um, <clears throat> I think the Warren Commission report was absolutely right, and <clears throat> I think the problem is that it's hard for the public to accept the idea that one punk kid did that much damage to the country. So there's got to be more to it. And uh, there just isn't. I think his relationship with Marina and his mother um, drove him to want to get some attention any way he could. <clears throat> he didn't care who he shot or how he got attention. And uh, so what convinces you that the Warren Commission was right, what in your experience? Well, the lack of any solid evidence to the contrary. I mean, after 40 years, if there was a conspiracy, it would have become unraveled by now, or long ago. Plus the fact that all the reporters in Dallas and a lot of from outside of Dallas investigated for years trying to find something. Um, and the, the things that I have personal knowledge of <coughs> makes me realize that a lot of these things are made up. They're, they're phony. Um, for example, I had one experience when some years later, I started getting phone calls one evening from all over. What had happened was, um, 
Penn Jones from Midlothian, who was one of the conspiracy authors, had uh, a new book, and he had a press conference in New York. And um, one of his statements was that uh, staff members of the Times Herald knew the truth, but weren't allowed to print it. And they insisted on a name. You know, who are you talking about? And he gave them my name. So I was getting all these calls from everywhere. What do you know that you couldn't print? <laughs> well, it was a lie. I mean, we all printed everything we could find and, and that would check out. And um, Hugh Ainsworth has probably done more investigation of the assassination than anybody alive. He's now with the Washington um, Times. And he, he ran down clues and hints and conspiracy theories for years and years and absolutely found nothing. Let's check my time. You actually heard the shots that day? Yes. Can you tell me what? Well, um, one of the problems is we were at ground level on that one block jog north. And we could see the top of the building and hear where the shots came from. Down in the canyon, the shots reverberated. So it sounded like more than three, and it sounded like more than one direction. And I think that contributed a lot to the conspiracy theories. People down in that canyon heard more than three shots. They heard them coming from different directions because they were reverberating. But up at ground level, we didn't have that reverberation. So I don't imagine you ever went over to the conspiracy museum. No, I'm, I'm not sure where it is even. <laughs> um, you know, there were a lot of theories that were ridiculous. There was, I think it was uh, Garrison in Louisiana was talking about somebody coming up from a manhole and firing the shots, and. Um, he referred to a, a particular opening in Dallas <clears throat> and checking it out, that pipe that he was talking about was about four inches across. And somebody confronted him with that. He uh, <clears throat> said, you know, it's, it's not big enough for anybody to come out of. He said, well, there are some really small people in this world. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about the four inches, but it was something really small. Okay. And, you know, there are a lot of things like that that just you can, you can verify, but mostly there are what ifs, you know. Could it have been? Well, you can make up anything possible, but... Um, the day of the assassination, we had a lot of trouble s sorting out what was fact from fiction. And uh, <clears throat> we put out four or five editions as fast as we could, and uh, there was very little, if any, that got in the paper that didn't check out as accurate. But, you know, there were people that said they saw the ex Secret Service exchange fire with somebody. Um, there are people who said they saw Lyndon Johnson get killed. People hallucinated. And there were all kinds of weird things floating around. So checking things out and making sure they were accurate was a, a major part of the job. Do you think that people are still going to continue to come to Dealey Plaza 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Probably so. Um, people still go to Ford's Theater. Um, 
it's it's just a part of American history and always will be. I'm glad they preserved the building. There were plans to tear it down several times, but I think it's a landmark. Was it kind of an organized effort to try to get rid of the building? Well, it's just nobody wanted it. It was the Texas School Board Depository. That was a warehouse district. Dealey Plaza wasn't uh, in the best part of town. I mean, it, it was that was a, a warehouse, and all around that that was long before the West End was developed. And the only thing down there was railroad spurs and warehouses. Um, It's ironical because he had a lot of good programs, but uh, couldn't get them through Congress. Um, he'll be remembered, I think, for the Peace Corps and some other things that he did accomplish. Um, his uh, foreign relations uh, were memorable. You know, his speech in Berlin, Ich bin ein Berliner. Um, he'll be, be remembered the, for those things in, in the start of the space program. Um, a lot of the things that he tried to do, Johnson was able to get done. Civil Rights Bill is the main one. Kennedy could never have gotten the Civil Rights Bill through Congress. But Johnson, being a Southerner, um, capitalizing on the sympathy involved in the assassination uh, was able to get the Civil Rights Bill passed and a lot of other things passed that were part of Kennedy's program, but Kennedy couldn't get done. So what do you think, how do you think things would have gone if he wouldn't have been shot in Dallas? Well, it would have been interesting. I, I think he would have done something about the Vietnam War he would have either escalated it or he would have ended it. And uh, I don't know what he would have done. Um, I think he would have changed the, uh, the, the military organization. I think he would have changed the commanders and the strategy But what he would have done about Vietnam is uncertain. Um, I don't think he would have let it drag out and, and ruin him the way it did Johnson. Um, I think he would have kept trying to get the Civil Rights Bill passed. He would have kept trying to uh, get some of his other uh, poverty programs passed. Um, <clears throat> And he would have probably had some success, but it's not—it's not really certain that he would have gotten reelected in '64. Um, he, you know, now he's overwhelmingly popular as a historical figure, but then um, he faced a tough reelection battle, and that's why he made Lyndon Johnson vice president so he could carry the South. But it would have been interesting to see what he had, would have done. And do you uh, have any political affiliation yourself? Or you... I'm a Democrat, but at the time I was working for newspapers, I never um, was active in anything and never let anybody know my politics. Um, <clears throat> as a political writer, people would always ask me, are you a Democrat or Republican? And, my answer was, I would always hope that you would never find out by reading what I write. And as a result, the Democrats thought I was a good Democrat, the Republicans thought I was a good Republican, 
business thought I was pro-business, labor thought I was pro-labor, simply because I tried to accurately report their position. And, you know, I would write a story and I'd get a phone call calling me a communist and the next phone call would call me a bircher, so I knew I was in the middle. So have you become politically active since you left? Not really. Uh, I vote and I sometimes go to democratic meetings and parties and I contribute a little bit. But no, it's still hard for me to be partisan about anything because of so many years on newspapers where I had to be nonpartisan. And how do you think uh, the parties have changed since Kennedy's time? I mean, obviously the South has changed. Well, it, the party politics have gotten a lot more vicious. Um, <clears throat> people like Sam Rayburn as Speaker of the House could work with the Republicans. Republicans could work with him. Um, Johnson worked pretty well with the Republican, Republicans in Congress. Now it's uh, just pretty vicious. It's hard for anybody to get anything done because the parties are so um, combative. I think there needs to be bipartisan politics. Um, there used to be a saying that politics ends at the at the at the ocean's edge, <clears throat> meaning that in foreign policy, it's not partisan. <clears throat> That's disappeared for sure. Um, is there anything that I've neglected to ask you? That you think? I think you pretty well covered it. Um, There's some interesting little sidelines uh, about the, the Kennedys. Uh, <clears throat> Jackie uh, went to a LULAC meeting in San Antonio <clears throat> and spoke to him in Spanish, which was very popular um, and unexpected. <clears throat> um, what kind of organization is it? The League of uh, United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, the Hispanic organization. <clears throat> um, when I was covering her the day of the assassination, I didn't know anything about fashion, so I asked her uh, press secretary to describe her outfit, and she let me know it was raspberry, not pink. <laughs> um, I was covering Kennedy and Johnson on an earlier visit when they were down at what was going to be the Space Center. What it was being built at the time near Houston. And uh, <clears throat> the five original astronauts were there. And they had a mock-up of the, uh, what was it, Freedom One? The, the first space capsule. And uh, <clears throat> Kennedy got up on a ladder and peered down into the space capsule. And the, we reporters were on the side. And uh, Jack Bell was uh, White House correspondent for the AP. And uh, <clears throat> he was a very tough type of reporter. When Kennedy looked down into the space capsule, Jack Bell yelled, Be careful, Jack. Lyndon will push you in. <coughs> Knowing that Lyndon and Jack were rivals. That was kind of funny. Uh, I guess the last thing I was thought of is, do you feel uh, ins insulted by the conspiracy? community and what they kind of portray as government and Johnson? And well, I, I, I feel badly for young people who 
have trouble getting history straight to start with. And uh, the fictionalized history bothers me because it's so confusing to young people. Um, what, what they are learning about Kennedy and, and those years is minimal in the school, I think. You don't get a lot of that more recent history. But they get a lot of this conspiracy stuff and fictionalized history. So I, I'm concerned about that. Like the JFK movie? Especially the JFK movie, which was pure fiction. And was apparently entertaining as history. But it wasn't history. <clears throat> and it must be very confusing to young people. So you didn't watch it? No. But I read a lot about it. Well, I appreciate your time. Good. Very interesting stuff. Good.